We start our next thematic block now with a short presentation by Simone Passarelli. She is a public health nutritionist. She has researched the connection between agriculture, food security, nutrition for over a decade. So she is really an expert. She's currently a AIA Science and Technology Policy Fellow in the Office of Global Food Security at the US Department of State. There she serves as a policy advisor to the Special Envoy for Global Food Security. So Simone Passarelli, the stage is all yours. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much to the organizers for having me and for putting on this critically important event. Today, I'll be discussing the vision for adapted crops in soils, or VAX, as we call it. Just waiting for my slides. They're there. We're all here because we recognize the severe threats to our global food security. Our food system is not meeting basic nutritional needs, with nearly one quarter of children under five experiencing stunting around the world. The number of people with undernutrition is actually increasing due to population growth, global crises, inflation, rising food demand, all while climate change is expected to de decrease crop yields. Climate models show that yields are especially threatened in Africa, and especially for the staple crops that so many people rely on, like maize and rice, that don't inherently have drought or heat tolerance. So what is the vision for adapted crops and soils? VAX is one policy instrument that the US government is taking to achieve more resilient food systems. And we're co-leading with the FAO and the African Union. VAX seeks to boost agricultural productivity and nutrition by developing diverse, climate-resilient crop varieties and building healthy soils. VAX is part of Feed the Future, and it's supported in part by a multi-donor funding platform that's been established at EFAD. However, VAX is much more than just a fund or a project. It's really, as the name implies, it's a vision. It's a movement, and we hope that Part of that movement speaks to everyone in this room today and that everyone sees a place for themselves in it. In addition to the EFAD fund, we're building private sector R&D partnerships with seed companies. We're funding, um, developing funding mechanisms at the FAO and with CGIAR. So there's many different ways to get involved. If you're interested, please come find me. We'd love to have you. The VAX philosophy focuses on building resilience both above the ground and below the ground. Above the ground um, with seeds and below the ground with soils. Because if we don't get these fundamentals right, we won't have adapted food systems. Above the ground, we're working on developing climate resilient crop varieties with a focus on nutritious indigenous and traditional crops, that, those that have received very little intention and investment but they hold immense promise for climate adaptation. So we've be begun the crop selection process with a focus initially on Africa, but we plan to expand to other regions around the world. And below the ground, VAX emphasizes the importance of soil and soil health to food security. Interventions that we plan to implement and have already started implementing focus on encouraging better land use planning, which I heard somebody mention earlier today, through improved farmer and government access to soil information systems, to extension services, and to inputs, with the ultimate goal being to improve soil health while preventing land degradation and reversing land degradation. So as part of VAX, we've taken a two-phase approach to crop selection, focusing on nutrition and climate resilience, respectively. In May, FAO hosted its first technical workshop for VAX, where we narrowed down a list of many hundreds of crops to the 60 that you see here, guided by which crops are most important for nutrition in Africa, and focused across these six food groups that you see, and regionally across the five African Union regions to ensure diet, both dietary and regional diversity. 
So the list you see here is an indicative list. I'm sure some people will see crops that are their favorites and you'll be wondering where your favorite crop is. <laughs> um, but just, just, this is a, just a starting point. It's just an indicative list. So we have a place to start. So it doesn't mean that crops not on the list won't be researched in the future. And for phase two, we've partnered with uh, the Crop Modeling Consortium, AGMIP, if some of you are familiar um, with that group led by Cynthia Rosenzweig at Columbia University. And she's partnered with Dillis McCarthy, who's leading um, the work from University of Ghana. And we'll assess how 30 of the crops you saw on the last slide will fare under climate change scenarios projected out to the year 2050 uh, across the African continent. So here you can see some very preliminary results just for TEF and Fonio, but like I said, there'll be 30 crop opportunity crop profiles. We'll be publishing those results and um, finalizing them in a workshop at the end of this month and then publishing them early next year. So you can see across this suite of different nutritional, biophysical, and of particular interest for this group, genetic resources, um, for these various indicators, um, you can see how they perform and the black line that you see sticking out is uh, compared to a maize baseline as a benchmark. So you can see how the, both of these crops are performing better in terms of nutrition and biophysical indicators like heat and drought tolerance. And unsurprisingly, they have fewer genetic resources and breeding programs compared to maize. But this is why the work that all of you do is so critical to the work we're trying to achieve with VAX because we will, at the end of the day, only be able to do crop improvement for the crops for which we have robust genetic resources and germplasm. So we need to continue to support the gene banks so that we can utilize those resources to bring more nutritious, climate-resilient varieties to farmers and then to consumers. So many thanks for listening and for all of you do, all of the work you do to support a food-secure future. And please, you can reach out to me here if you'd like to get more involved in VAX, and we hope you'll join our movement. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. And the kind invitation, of course, to network today as well. So take the photograph of that QR code, get together on LinkedIn, connect with each other, and then stay connected as well, of course, during... The, the weeks to follow. So thank you, Simone Passarelli. We continue with a pre-recorded video message by the Executive Director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, Lawrence Haddad. Hello, everyone. My name is Lawrence Haddad. I'm the Executive Director of the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition or GAIN. Uh, colleagues, we live in um, shock-prone times. We probably have for quite a while now without realizing quite the extent of it, but we certainly do now. Uh, climate change developing a, a steady drumbeat of disruption. Um, on top of that, we have conflicts in erupting in various parts of the world and, and not being resolved in various parts of the world. And there's always the threat of the next major pandemic. The antidote to all of this uncertainty and uh, stress and shocks is diversity, diversity in what is produced, diversity in what is consumed, and diversity of income sources. These, um, but diversity is in short supply at the moment. We have, uh, we rely very much on a few major staple crops, um, and this means we have to import um, large, large amounts of uh, different types of foods using very long value chains if we're going to have a diverse diet. Uh, those very long value chains are in themselves vulnerable and uh, generate generate um, emissions that we, we can do without and also open things up to uh, food loss and, and unsafe food. So how do we diversify our diets and diversify the foods we have access to? Well, a, a, big, a big part of that is starts at the foundation of the pyramid. If the top of the pyramid is diets, the foundation of the pyramid is having enough diverse planting material to um, diversify the types of crops that are grown. And that's where the crop trust comes in. It's so important in what it's doing to preserve different types of planting material for, for the ages and throughout the ages. Next, we have to um, diversify what is actually planted in the fields. Farmers need uh, support. They need to 
uh, need, they need the technology, they need the infrastructure to take the risk that is involved in, to, in planting new crops. Um, they need the expertise, the extension support, etc. And they need the finance. Um, consumers need uh, reassurances that foods that were once forgotten uh, are now um, need to be revalorized and made to seem desirable. That means uh, demand creation uh, and campaigns. So demand creation, um, enough variety of planting material and value chains that can support the planting of different crops um, and to connect them to markets and give farmers the reassurance they need to take a risk to diversify their, their crop production. All of these elements are absolutely vital to diversifying diets and making food systems much more resilient than they currently are. I very much hope that you will identify some key innovations and key actions that we can all take, including GAIN, to make that a reality. I wish you all the best in your session. Thank you. That's wonderful, the question of key actions and for the key to-dos. And now I hand over to the next moderator of the panel discussion. She is the Innovative Finance and Sustainability Lead at the Crop Trust. She is focused on broadening the Crop Trust range of financial partnerships and instruments to support its fundraising goals. Please welcome the moderator of the next session, Jasper Sam. Thank you for <laughs> moderating. And we are excited Thank you. for your guests, of course. Wonderful. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. And I'm very pleased to be moderating this panel and be sharing the stage with four extremely experienced, extremely interesting and diverse perspectives. And the plan with today's, uh, today's session, this is the second panel focused on crop diversity and transforming our food system. And the idea here is to really we, we touched upon it in the first panel in terms of how important crop diversity is, but now with the speakers that we have with us today, the idea is to really go into much more richer stories around the value of crop diversity. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming our speakers. I'd like to um, first bring forward Vanessa Rodriguez Asuna. And Vanessa joins us from, she's the net zero sector track lead at the UNEP uh, FI, and she's also one of the lead coordinators on the IPBS biodiversity work. So thank you for joining us. Um, secondly, I'd like to ask Alejandro Argumedo. Alejandro is the indigenous Quechua leader and current coordinator of the International Network of Mountain Indigenous Peoples. Thirdly, it's my pleasure to introduce and have come on stage Tarifa Alzaba. She is the director general for the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture. And our fourth panelist is Neil Watkins. <laughs> and Neil is the Deputy Director, Global Policy and Advocacy <laughs> Division from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So thank you and welcome all of you this morning. And so I'd like to just start off, I think we've, uh, we've received a lot of information this morning, but sometimes it's helpful just to have um, an anecdote or a story or, or a small fact to, to capture some of the, um, some of the importance of, of what it is we're speaking about today. So I'd actually just like to, to start off um, and ask each of my panelists to, you know, to spend a minute or two, uh, each share a fact or an anecdote that really brings to life crop diversity and its potential and power in terms of transforming our food systems. Um, so Vanessa, could I please start with you? Yes, good morning and thank you so much for, for having the privilege for inviting me here and having the privilege to share some insights with you today. 
Uh, for me, crop diversity is a dear topic because I come from Bolivia originally, a uh, center of origin of potato, for example, among other very diverse uh, crops. So it's very important to me. And what I love to, uh, what I heard today is uh, from uh, Mr. Özdemir, is uh, foundation. And I love the title of this panel, which is Nature as Solution. I believe that besides nature being sol a solution, nature is the foundation for, to all economies. We depend on the diversity of living things for all, to, to provide us with all the contributions that all people need. And uh, an important fact that has always surprised me is that 70, more than 75% of the global crops all over the world depend, rely on pollination. So all, most of the vegetables, fruits, and, and, and different coffee, cocoa, almonds, they, uh, they rely on animal pollination. So we depend so much on, on nature, but we're not doing a good job in, uh, in producing and consuming food, which is we, we heard today it is associated with many so unsustainable ways of, uh, of production and consumption, and that is leading to an homogenization, agriculture being uh, most of the calorie intake is based on really few farming systems, few crops, and which is not enough uh, to provide all the elements necessary for a healthy diet, a balanced diet full of other ingredients and also that makes all, uh, all of us vulnerable to the changes uh, uh, posed by climate change and we're experiencing this every day in the news and it doesn't matter where uh, you look at, your, at, at the news, you, uh, you're seeing these increases uh, in temperature, erratic, uh, changing the patterns of droughts, extreme events and that's making uh, populations more susceptible and mm -hmm. vulnerable to climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. And I think that 75% relying on pollination and just our vulnerability that we're, we don't always reflect upon. Alejandro, could I ask you to share your, your fact or, or anecdote? Yeah, gracias. Um, yeah, let me um, share something more personal. Um, first, I was thinking in this variety of potato that makes the brides cry. This is grows in the potato park in Cusco, Peru. But being in this church, uh, I was thinking that perhaps something more um, spiritual uh, could be appropriate. And um, I'm remembering my childhood, early in the morning, you know, the aroma of potatoes cooked by my grandmother mixed with herbs that were, you know, fill the, the place where I was sleeping. I would wake up to this very beautiful dish with potatoes of different shape, different color, you know, and the taste of it the, uh, brings to me, you know, this idea that uh, you need, also you sense, that is also, the, what we're talking about is also sensorial. It's, it's something that connects you directly with nature. Because my grandmother used to put these potatoes offering to, to the mountain gods. So this issue of connecting uh, food to its source, it's very important because we are not going to change anything if we don't, we don't change our values. Mm. This is not uh, a matter of more money or more policies or more things, but how we as humans, you know, um, um, change those values that are affecting the way we produce food or consume food and go back to the roots 
and create from there solutions that you know can actually work. So um, I, I hear this morning some, someone saying that um, uh, you know the crop diversity is the you know the, um, the the hidden hero, but in reality it's the hidden hero are like um, farmers, indigenous peoples, women that are keeping that part, that diversity in the centers of diversity and origin of where these crops are. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. I think evoking that, that memory of your grandmother's potatoes and just reminding all of us, I mean, when we speak about food, of course, we're speaking intellectually, but we all have a very personal connection. Uh, I mean, the food system impacts us on, on so many levels and, um, and using some of that connection to, to, and some of that passion to, uh, to, to work on this topic is, is incre incre an incredibly powerful lever for, for change. Tarifa, over to you. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me here. I think what has been mentioned this morning is uh, quite inspiring as well. I mean, the importance of this subject comes timely because of the climate change impact that it's something we used to hear about in, on TV. We used to um, learn about it in university, but now we are really living it. And we're mm -hmm. discussing uh, true solutions that should have been adopted yesterday, not even today. And also going from the fact that the International Center for Bicycle Agriculture motto is agriculture for tomorrow. So I was quite touched this morning with the speech from the young lady who has participated and shared her opinion. It's very much important for us to consider the social inclusion in these solutions. It's not only about innovation and science, but about the stakeholders, the stories from the grandparents, the story from the culture. Food is a quite personal. Mm -hmm. It's not only about feeding the world, but also try to feed them with passion and love and ensure that what we offer is something really sustainable that would stay with them and will touch their soul. I would share a so short story of what we have been doing at ICBA, and I think it's fascinating because bringing women and bringing young people and also different generations together with, uh, through cooking lessons. Uh, again, if I'm going to go and introduce a crop which is quite foreign to a culture, I, I find it difficult. I mean, if I go to my parents, they would never eat uh, quinoa, for example. It's a crop that we've been working on. It's very popular in your country. But introducing it to them to replace rice, for example, of what they have been really depending on, it's a quite difficult. So through the uh, examples and learning by doing and engaging them into bringing and simplifying science and making it really applied that it goes to the smallholder farmers and going through the field itself, I think this is the right approach where we can focus on a crop, crop diversity and ensure that we engage um, stakeholders and we have that kind of buy-in, not only top-down approach, but also down-top approach. Excellent. No, I think uh, definitely in terms of that human connection, both in terms of inspiring us for change, but also in terms of making sure that change is effective, really being adopted, um, and also in, in the local context, recognizing what's, um, what works in one area may not work in another, and making sure you have that space for, for local exchange. Neil, over to you. Great. Thanks very much for, <clears throat> thanks very much for having me. And I, I want to share an example of some of the work that our foundation is doing by talking about bananas, actually. Um, and this is a food that is ubiquitous in grocery stores in Europe and North America and consumed globally. But it's also very vulnerable and a case study of why crop diversity and gene banks are so critical. I think many of you will know that in the global banana trade, Cavendish variants are 60% of global banana production, likely what you buy at the supermarket if you go down the street here in Germany. They all come from one seedling, so their DNA fingerprint is essentially the same. That means there's a lot of genetic risk that if there's a pathogen or a pest that comes along, like the Fusarium TR4 pathogen, right now threatening Cavendish varieties around the world, and the deadly banana bunchy top virus spreading in Africa today. So while lots of attention is paid to the Cavendish bananas, because we eat them in the north, given the economic value, the two main variety sets for smallholder farmers in, in Africa receive less attention. Um, take East African highland bananas. There's about 100 varieties, but they're all variations of one another. 
And this lack of genetic diversity means that if a pathogen or a pest attacks, then millions of hectares of bananas are at risk. So farmers in East Africa do a lot to counter this risk themselves by intercropping, which makes, them, which makes for a more diverse farm landscape. Banana is also a stable anchor crop that helps preserve the soil and nutrients. But cultivated bananas themselves aren't genetically diverse, so they remain at risk of being wiped out by pests and diseases, undermining both livelihoods and food security. But there are ways to address this through innovative approaches to crop breeding that include and involve wild banana relatives. At the foundation, we invest in partners like CGIAR to do that kind of breeding for bananas and other clonal crops with similar vulnerability. We're working to develop new varieties with more genetic diversity, tapping more of the genetic resources from the center of origin. This allows improved quality and desirable traits that farmers want, and also more genetic diversity. And gene banks and collections are absolutely critical to doing this kind of work. Great, thank you. So I think moving on to the, the second part, one of the things we were th thinking about in terms of how to organize or tie in the, the, the experts that we have here is to, to use the lens of the concept of resilience. Um, because we talk a lot about crop diversity enhancing resilience, the resilience of food systems, but maybe we can, we can really unpack that word res resilience and help us to understand the power of crop diversity in, in a number of different directions or dimensions. And so I'd like to pick up the, the definition of resilience that's been proposed by Johan Rockström, who's one of the leading contributors on the, on the work around global planetary boundaries. And he's defined resilience as the capacity to live and develop with change. Live and develop with change. And there's a few different dimensions of resilience. I'd, I'd like to go further. And moving to you, Vanessa, one of the aspects when we look at that overarching definition of resilience is resilience means an adaptive capacity to absorb shocks and avoid ne negative tipping points. And Vanessa, I'd like to come back to you, particularly when, it, when we're thinking about adaptive ca capacity and from a, farm, from a farmer perspective, if you can perhaps share some of your experiences around how crop diversity links and um, promotes resilience. Thank you so much. That's a very interesting question, and that's a, such an important strategy available to, to farmers through crop diversity to increase their adaptive capacity to deal with the impacts of climate change. I'll give you some, a concrete example by which I learned in, in my uh, research years in the Amazon region. So I was actually looking at this question, and I was analyzing different types of production systems, talking to farmers, it's very highly specialized in cassava production, for example, and others that mix different types of uh, crops, and trying to understand which are the factors mm. that uh, play an important role when there is, a, for example, an extreme event, an event of a, a drought or uh, a flood, as I was there, there was a, one of the, the worst floods in the region, so I could really experience it from the ground. And what was interesting is that uh, the, the, how crop diversity, those farmers, for example, that had a very diversified portfolio of uh, crops, and they have access to this genetic richness, let's say, within crops and knowledge, and the safety nets as well, and access to knowledge, they were, of course, in better, better off to cope uh, with the impacts. A concrete example, cassava. There was a time where there was much more rain, uh, rainfall falling in a certain region, and there were particular communities that had the traditional knowledge of a specific cassava uh, that were not prone to the disease by these, uh, by, by, by these uh, floods. So they were capable of, let's say, they did not lose everything because they had, and also if they diversified and they were not only uh, producing cassava and they had beans and they had intercropping, when such an extreme event came, mm. they were able to cope. And on top of that, of course, that's not the only factor. 
if they have a strong social net, if they have associations, if they have local knowledge, it also, of course, helps them increase their ability to cope with extreme events, for example. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alejandro, over to you. Another, another element or, or part of that definition of resilience is a capacity to prepare for and learn from uncertainty and surprise. Can you share with us from your, from your experience and perspective, um, coming with the, with, the, with the world of indigenous knowledge, how, how that ability to prepare for capacity, uh, to prepare for uncertainty and surprise and crop diversity, how, how it can support that. Yeah. I collaborate with a global network of indigenous peoples in mountain uh, environments. Um, most, most of our members live around centers of diversity and the origin of food crops. But if we imagine a map of the world of those centers, you're going to see that those areas also have a occurrence of very extreme events, not recent, but from the past, say El Nino in the Andes, or hurricanes in Central America. We're talking about potatoes, mice, or typhoons in Southeast Asia. So indigenous peoples, you know, traditional communities in those areas have accumulated intelligence, knowledge, that from where we have to start. It's like a 10,000 years of agriculture, for instance, in Peru. You know, as an agricultural uh, civilization that evolved separated from the rest of the world, technology, engineering, um, social organization, you know, they build an empire based on food. No a cent. There was no money. But we build an empire on, you know, food diversity. And I think there's lots of uh, what we can learn from those areas um, where people continue to nurture diversity in environments that are becoming more and more unstable. But the collaboration that we need to do in this new time, it's also important. So, uh, for instance, in our network, we have um, worked with a crop trust to um, establish uh, or upscale what we have done in the Potato Park in, in Cusco, Peru. Um, so that we can create area-based conservation approaches where food is at the center of solutions, mm. where rights of indigenous peoples and local farmers are recognized, and you can create a more inclusive type of um, approaches. You know, it, the gene banks are very important in this, but so is in situ conservation. So I think this dichotomy, which is largely artificial between in situ and ex situ, have to come together. And we have to work in a more dynamic way mm. where there is like a, this a cross fertilization, not only by transferring uh, material, but also sharing knowledge. The old wisdom, the new knowledge, they have to come together. And we had to, you know, um, a, a bring a more closely, and that bridge that separates in situ here, um, ex situ there, has to become one system. And for that, of course, um, respect, collaboration, uh, it's, uh, it's necessary. The knowledge systems of indigenous peoples and not only have to be recognized, but we need to actually, uh, you know, walk the talk right. and implement this into policy that actually is, uh, uh, you know, uh, works in our countries. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, Tarifa, over to you. Um, 
capacity for keeping options alive and creating space for innovation. So I think as the, uh, the, d the director of the Biosilin Center, I'm sure you have quite a lot to say in terms of how crop diversity supports, supports innovation in the area. Yeah. It's um, very much, I mean, everything that we're talking about today is about science and innovation, whether from the experience of working with the indigenous people or even through the scientific theories that our scientists have been working on and testing. However, we need to step back also and look at the baseline. I mean, we're aware that there are around 30,000 uh, different species that has been identified as edible, and only 150 we are relying on, of which is we have three or four we take our basic intake of energy from, which is maize, wheat, and rice, which is really we made our options limited. It is now nobody else act. It's just because the way we have, um, I would say, adopted to such system. So through innovation, we need to go back. I mean, either we need to find the solutions. We cannot definitely expect different results if we continue doing more of the same. So definitely, we would need to um, employ science and innovation to look at alternatives, to look at sustainable approaches, to look at different approaches when it comes to what indigenous people are doing and how can we really incorporate that. Trying to work with the environment, I mean, nature-based solutions is very much important for us. How can we grow in our own land? When we faced COVID and everybody got interrupted with the food system, we realized it was a true example from our current era how food is powerful and how food security is very much important for different nations. So we need to eat what we can grow. And if there are ways that we identify those neglected and forgotten crops, it is very much important for us to identify them and try to revive them. Mm -hmm. We are working um, currently on a project with FAO on Save the Millets campaign. We're looking at millets. Millets is very much important in many countries, but important for us also to understand the baseline. Where is it? How are people uh, identifying it? And if is it really neglected and forgotten? I mean, we've got to understand the replacement and how our people are dealing with this replacement. It's beyond only food. I repeat, it's important also to focus on the healthy and nutritionist factors mm -hmm. that we are looking at. So, I mean, we had a beautiful presentation at the beginning talking about the portfolio of those crops important when it comes to nutrition. I mean, this is science. This is something we need to educate people about, and we need to build the capacity of individuals to identify those crops, and therefore they will have the buy-in and will adapt to them. We have projects in seven sub-Saharan African countries where we try to uh, diversify the crops there through identifying the crops which are smart, climate smart. I mean, we keep identifying those names uh, for those crops. I mean, crops that will adapt to the climate change and how can they become adaptive and sustainable through the uh, proper management of natural resources as well. So we are aware of the challenges associated with soil health, with water, access to water and water scarcity, and what kind of those crops we will be um, adopting and working on through even um, genomic sequencing. I mean, we've been trying to understand the behavior of those crops in different environments, so it will be very important to engage more mm. scientists, and I think the power of synergy and collaboration. I mean, we are all doing so many wonderful uh, projects and research globally. Yeah. Why don't we join forces? I mean, if we want to really um, ensure that we are reaching sustainable development goals together. I mean, goal number 17 is all about a partnership. So it's very mo much important to join hands and enforce the power of science and ensure that we are all together in this. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Neil, over to you for, for the fourth area. Um, so the fourth, fourth part of that definition on, on resilience is a capacity for systematic transformation away from crisis and unsustainable development paths. Neil, I think you're well positioned to speak about that. Sure. Maybe, yeah. First, I just want to say I think um, biodiversity has really clear benefits you know, at every level of our food system, from farmers, from, from farmers' fields to the very food on our kitchen tables. You know, on our plates, we call this dietary diversity. You know, it's having a wide range of foods is key, as Sophie and others said earlier, to a healthy, nutritious, sustainable diet. In the fields, farmers know that planting a wide range of crops has a ton of benefits. Intercropping, inter intercropping protects soil health and nutrients, diversifying crops, 
reduce their vulnerability to threats like drought, pest, and disease. So I think cultivating a basket of foods that are both varied and genetically diverse can really help farmers reduce the threat that one single event might, might have to impact their food security. We also know, and multiple people have mentioned this, but it's worth underscoring, the climate impacts are really intensifying. So there's a huge need for greater investment and efforts to help small-scale farmers and other actors throughout the food system adapt to climate change. The amount of climate finance that has, act, has soared in recent years, which is great, but only 1.7% of that climate finance goes to help invest in smallholder farmers to adapt to climate change. We need to change that. Um, last year at the COP27, our foundation joined with others and we announced we would invest $1.4 billion over the next four years to address the lack of investment in climate adaptation in Africa for smallholder farmers supporting a range of things from helping farmers get more reliable weather information to supporting African policymakers and negotiators to have the access to the best science. Um, and some of these funds will support partners, like many in this room, to develop a steady stream of new crop varieties that can help farmers cope with more frequent encounters with drought and flood, pests and diseases. I just say a lot of this work would be impossible without the genetic resources that are conserved in gene banks, including those managed by the CJR system, which is one of our largest partners in that work. Mm -hmm. And just to underscore, seed banks, as many in this room know, and gene banks are not museums. They don't just store heirloom, heirloom seeds or genetic resources just for the sake of conserving them. They conserve these resources so we can use them to develop new varieties and innovations that are better suited to the changing climate and emerging threats. And just one initiative we support as an example it's called the Allele Mining Project, where, we, we, where CGIR researchers from CIMIT are identifying heat and drought adaptive genetic variants, or alleles, in gene banks and deploying them in new varieties for small-scale producers. So, and I just, you know, underscore that this groundbreaking research would be impossible without the CGIR gene banks and the Crop Diversity Endowment Fund, which provides a lot of vital resources for these centers so that this important research can continue. Excellent. Thank Thanks. you. So I, there's, a, there's a flashing light, so I think we're, we're running on board time, but I'd like to, I've asked all of you to think about sort of really a key takeaway message, and if I could ask you to, to boil it down to 10, 20 seconds each, something for the audience to think about over lunch. So, Vanessa, can I start with you? I'll try my best. Collaboration <laughs> is key. Everyone told us, before, and it has to be, we have to think in a holistic way, not siloed, and from production to consumption, including all relevant stakeholders, farmers, technical assistants, financial institutions, business, scientists, policy makers, all. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Alejandro? I think um, less greed and less profit, less money, Money is not going to save what money has created. So we need like um, to change, uh, a deep change in terms of um, our own uh, value system. Right. So that, that can change actually the food system. Values. Nice. Um, resource mobilization and I think um, also um, building on each other's strengths. We need to change the formula. One plus one is not equal to plus one. One plus one is equal 11. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, Neil? So I'm an advocate, so I think, I think we can do a better job of making the case for the importance of crop diversity and investing in things like gene banks. And I think climate change gives us that chance mm. to do that because the world is talking about that. COP28 is coming up in a few short weeks. I mean, I think we should be putting some messages on the top of that agenda. You know, supporting crop diversity is not a nice to do. It's a critical tool for climate adaptation. Um, gene banks aren't museums. They're cutting edge, you know, labs for the future. Um, the CGIR system is an engine of innovations that farmers need to be fully funded and is a climate best buy. And I think we should listen to what African leaders and South Asian leaders and institutions are telling us that we need more investment in smallholder farmers to adapt to climate change, and that should be on the top of the priority list in Dubai in a few weeks. Right. So let's get behind those calls. Excellent. So we have advocacy, we have resource mobilization, we have values, we have collaboration. And 
I think want all of you to, to leave really with that idea. We've been talking about the transformation and resilience of food systems, how crop diversity supports that. But it's not just the crop diversity supports the resilience of our food systems and supports that transformation. It's ultimately our resilience as a species, our ability to live and develop with the change that crop diversity is underpinning. So thank you all and look forward to moving on with the session. Katie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll, yep. Thank you very much for that interesting hour and some, of course, points to reflect on in our lunch break. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to have our next keynote speaker now here on stage. She is a, a, an award-winning chef and educator, a food systems advocate. So what influenced her cooking philosophy? That's what I questioned and asked. And um, when reading about her on the internet, she credits her mother and travels to over 40 countries as a humanitarian aid worker for the United Nations for that love of cooking. And almost 10 years ago then, she returned to Ghana, home to Ghana, to establish Midunu, Midunu Chocolates, and the Midunu Institute uh, as love letters to the continent, as love letters to Africa, a dedication to celebrate, but also to preserve Africa's rich culinary heritage. And when I follow her Instagram, I just warn you, you are craving for chocolate for the rest of your life. I just wanted to put that out as a warning, but you should give her a follow and you should give her a big round of applause. Here, this is Selassie Adadika. <laughs> Great to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, let's see. I'm standing between you and lunch, so I need your attention and I love your help for this uh, discussion. I'd first like for everybody to close their eyes and think about your favorite dish. I'm going to give you a couple moments to think about it, start salivating. Um, eyes still closed. I hope you have an image of what it is. If maybe you're in Europe, you're thinking maybe Italy, you're probably thinking pasta, maybe some beautiful eggplant um, along with it and some herbs that are local. Maybe if you're from Mexico, you're thinking some beautiful, um, maybe tortillas made with indigenous varieties of corn. Maybe some beautiful tomatoes, maybe some beans on that plate. Maybe you guys are thinking about a dish. Maybe it's something from your hometown, possibly. Maybe a, a raise of hands if it's a dish from your hometown. Um, maybe it's a dish that your mother, your grandmother, or somebody used to make for you. Now imagine if that dish no longer existed. Open your eyes. So that was very much my experience. Uh, my family left Ghana when I was about five or six years old, and when I went back, I realized that a lot of the foods that I was uh, used to eating as a child no longer existed in the mainstream. And um, that's one of the reasons I actually started maybe sort of doing a career change and becoming a culinary ambassador, because I felt it was really, really important for us to understand this. Um, so I'm waiting for my presentation to come up. OK. So um, I was born in Ghana. We had political instability, and my family moved to the United States. So I learned um, one of the best ways for us to preserve our culture was through food. My mother cooked for us. She was able to find ingredients in the US that were similar or coming up with uh, really creative solutions for us to maintain our food culture. And um, as a child, I wanted to be a doctor. So I was pre-med making, uh, let's see, um, I was making anesthesia, I was making aspirin in the lab in high school. But by the time I got to college, I ended up changing my mind. And as an immigrant child in the United States, I had three choices in life. And I don't know if anyone else in the audience um, had similar, but what are the three choices that you can imagine that I had in life? 
doctor, lawyer, and actually engineer. So those are the three options I had. So by the time I had ruled out uh, doctor, my parents were a bit nervous. They were both lawyers, and I was not going to become an engineer. Um, and so I ended up with the fourth option, which is like disgrace to the family. And so uh, technically at college, they called it geography <laughs> and environmental studies. And so that's what I studied. After that, I tried to redeem myself. So I did the thing that I could do coming from Ghana. It was like Kofi Annan, United Nations. So I joined the UN and I vowed to support communities um, that were affected by different um, either man-made or natural disasters. So I ended up, um, sorry, I ended up doing humanitarian work for the United Nations and seeing people in different situations um, and seeing how food affected them and, and um, brought them together. Many times when people think about Africa, we think food insecurity rather than the abundance of food that we have. And so I started eating really, really well as I traveled to over 40 African countries. Um, Central African Republic, it was maboke. They use a leaf that's foraged to steam food and different uh, fish ingredients. Um, we've got uh, dishes like in Ghana that are coming from different leaves, whether it's cocoa yam leaves, whether it's amaranth leaves. Um, Liberia was one of my favorite places where a lot of the greens that they eat um, in other countries are known as things that we feed our animals. My Liberian friend told me that when they were growing up, they didn't learn what to eat. They were taken out to be pointed out what not to eat because the list of what to eat was so large that the focus was just don't eat these plants. Everything else is edible and that's what you should be doing. So I fell in love with all the dishes and I was just amazed, but I started seeing lots of patterns. Um, my geography background got me to understand the biomes and the different um, aspect of what we eat is um, from what grows where we are. So I started seeing the differences um, going from the coast to the, sort of the Sahelian, northern parts of Ghana. Um, I started seeing that regionality of cuisine. I started seeing also the patterns in culture. What do we eat? What do we not eat? When do we not eat certain things? So for example, in Ghana, we have taboo days. So there are certain things you don't eat or do on certain days. So Tuesdays are taboo for fishing. We do not fish on Tuesdays because we must leave the waters time to recover for what it has given us. I started seeing that despite the fact that most sub-Saharan Africans were lactose intolerant, nomadic populations have actually adapted genetically to be able to consume and process dairy. I started seeing a lot of um, how just culture um, was impacting our food choices. I started seeing that the fact that we live in warmer climates meant that we had to be very serious about our preservation techniques. I started seeing salting, drying as ways of preserving our foods, drying them, uh, fermenting them so that we wouldn't have to worry about them spoiling and being wasted. And I started seeing sustainability practices. So um, rice is indigenous to many parts of Africa, uh, but rice is very labor intensive. So culturally, historically, what you see are certain dishes that involve rice are actually for special occasions. So it's not meant to be eaten every single day. So um, with all of this, I started realizing that there were lessons from the African kitchen that I wanted to take forward. And that's when I ended up leaving the United Nations and starting my own uh, work in Ghana. And the idea really was, how do I take these lessons that I've learned and try to look at ways in which we can start to eat better? Um, some of the lessons I learned, the first one is plant forward. So <clears throat> in um, a lot of African countries, you'll see plants as a source of protein used in dishes. So this one is using um, groundnuts. Um, we use a lot of nuts and seeds to create the, the, the warmth of um, texture, um, and as well as having protein in the dishes. I started seeing no waste. So making sure that every single part, whether it's a plant or an animal, are eaten. For example, um, I'm always shocked and surprised when I meet people, um, particularly in the US, and we're talking about you know, either sweet potatoes, and I'm like, the leaves are delicious, and they don't know that we can eat the leaves. And imagine that you're leaving, as a farmer, something that's amazing um, in the farm that someone could be eating for nutrition, but also to make more money as a farmer. Um, I started seeing bold flavors, so all those fermented uh, ingredients, all of those dried, preserved ingredients have beautiful ways of adding flavor into the food. 
ancient grains we've talked about, I think earlier we were, um, talked about teff, we talked about fonio. Uh, if we add millet and sorghum, those are all ancient grains that do really well with poor quality soil, with very little rainfall, um, with very little um, additional inputs into the soil, and we're not consuming them because in many ways, um, we've been told and we believe that it's for poor people. So how do we change that? How do we change that and make that sexy again? How do we make sure people understand that, well, you know, we used to, yes, we used to eat it in the lean season, but we can eat it now. And in fact, with climate change, how do we get more and more people excited about these ingredients? Because that is the way forward. Communal dining, I started seeing the way that we ate. So um, the name of my company is Midunu, and Midunu is an Eve word, uh, it's short. The original long version is Va Midunu, come let's eat. It's an invitation, inviting all those around you to eat with you. We don't eat alone. Um, in much of, many of the cultures, you're invited to eat not just at the table, but oftentimes sharing the same plate. So um, I just, the lessons about learning to share and eat and having good eating habits um, are things that I started seeing around the continent. And then, of course, wild and foraged foods. A lot of uh, foods that we eat um, traditionally have been foraged and may not actually be documented. So what you're starting to see is a lot of these foods are um, slowly um, going out of style. So I went back to Ghana and I was excited to start seeing some of these things that I had encountered in many of my trips. Um, preservation techniques, um, sustainability practices, looking at cultural and traditional practices and how that influenced the food. But I started hearing different things. I started hearing about climate change and the difference in the rainfall. I started hearing about the lifestyle changes, people not eating at home, people eating out all the time, um, families not having time to have meals together. I um, started seeing new influences and trends and seeing um, a lot of fast food, whether local or imported in terms of international foods. Um, but I also started seeing that there was a lot less time, a lot less resources um, that were happening. So I started realizing that Africa is losing its culinary culture really, really fast um, for a lot of different reasons. And many ways um, in Accra, you're more likely to see a KFC than you would see um, a restaurant um, that's bringing a lot of indigenous flavors to the table. You would see maybe someone making local food but using imported ingredients. So um, this is a quote, um, a number, I think it's a little bit off because it was quite some time ago, but it probably is worse than this. Uh, many African countries are net importers of food. So we're talking about billions of dollars. And so this estimate was that by 2025, $110 billion would be spent on the importation of food into the continent. So we are exporting cash crops, getting money, and then buying the food we need to eat. Something is wrong with this equation. In the grocery stores, you are likely to see mostly imported food, not local food. So what is wrong with our food system and how do we start to change that? The other thing that's important to understand about this number is that that number is the same number that it would take for us to fix the electricity problems in the continent. So what if that money was being invested into the food system? What would happen if that actually went to creating value chains for ingredients that we were eating and consuming and needed in our diets, rather than sending out? So I started trying to understand, not only are we not sharing our culinary culture in terms of food with the outside world, but we're also not sharing it internally. Um, when I moved back, I realized that the team of women that I was working with, many of them actually didn't know the recipes or the foods that I had grown up eating. And um, it, my family had been gone. I moved back 30 years after my family left, but a lot of these dishes had kind of fallen out of the system. And not even really exotic ones. We're talking about things like guava, things that are you know, in your mind are not that exotic, that are actually no longer readily and easily available in urban centers. So um, when I started thinking about what was um, sort of pushing this loss of biodiversity, I started seeing the linkage of the food to so many other sectors. And with everybody in this room here, there's a lot of us working in different areas, but we must all work together because the forces that are keeping biodiversity from happening 
are in all the different sectors. So if we take a look at trade and economy, the trade imbalances are allowing imported foods to come in to different spaces and places, and that's sometimes what's making the decision in the way that we're eating. The environment, the environment is changing, so that's also influencing the way that we're eating. But the way we treat the environment is also having negative impacts. So in Ghana, we have illegal gold mining, which is actually contaminating our water sources. Um, so how does that come in? We have health and nutrition. Um, we have arts and culture in terms of, of what we're talking about, and specifically biodiversity. What are government policies doing to impact the way that we're eating? So for me, I started seeing that there were four steps in which I could, in my way, start to support and um, engage with biodiversity and having more diversity on my plate. One is really to understand what's at risk, what are these ingredients, and um, why are they not present? Um, it's really, really important to understand the bottlenecks. Um, I took millet for one example. I was obsessed with millet when I moved back to Ghana. And um, I wanted to use it in as many ways as possible, so I got my team to get some millet. First lesson, millet was not available in a grocery store, which meant I had to go to the local market, which means there's actually an apartheid on certain ingredients. So if it's being consumed by certain parts of the population, we put it in a grocery store. If not, it goes somewhere else. Then I realized that um, once we bought the millet, we had to clean it out because it was thrashed on the ground. So then you have to go and pick out all the stones from the millet. Then um, my team prepared it, and I, it was beautiful. I took a bite, and I just heard <coughs> there were still stones in there. So I asked them, how did you do it? And they said, well, we, you know, we put it on a tray, we picked out all the stones, um, and, and we got everything we could see. So I realized, okay, they did the best they could. Um, I called my cousin who grew up in northern Ghana, and she said, please, come to the house. So I got there, she had a big bowl, calabash, and a second calabash, a smaller one. She filled the large one with water. She took the smaller one, picked some millet, she slowly kind of dipped the bowl into the larger one with the water, and water came and lifted out basic gravity, lifted out the light millet. She kept kind of rocking it back and forth, water going in, millet coming out, water going in, millet coming out. At the end, she was left with a small calabash filled with stones. And that's the traditional way of cleaning millet. She also told me that with the millet, um, actually when you eat it in many parts of Accra and Ghana, it's served in a way that's ground. They have to grind it because there's so many stones that most people actually have a problem. So it's easier to do recipes where it's milled rather than when it's whole. So then I saw another problem. So because it's poorly processed, we're only limited to certain recipes that we could use it for. I went back to my team and I started showing them this new technique, and they were like, oh, this one that lives in America has all these fancy ideas. And I was like, no, no, let me show you how it's done. And it's interesting because I lived outside of Ghana, came back to Ghana, and I'm now teaching my team an indigenous tr traditional practice of cleaning millet that they're not aware of because they grew up in, a, in an urban area. And so we made it, the dish is delicious, but in terms of understanding that bottleneck, most women are not going to go buy the millet to prepare for their family after working a long day and being stuck in traffic for several hours. They're going to cook rice, which cooks in 20 minutes, and then get the food on the table. So understanding that basic thing, okay, great, I have a bottleneck analysis on part of the, the, the demand. Now we need to understand the supply. Um, farmers are not going to use improved technique because they are going to end up in the, in the market. They're not going to get a grocery store, they're not going to get the higher price. They don't have the equipment, and so these are the different things that they have to deal with. So really for me, this plan is based on number one, understanding what are the ingredients and what are the issues around them, and then creating a value chain. How do we get the farmers to get the improved equipment? How do we get the consumers to be excited to make this dish and bringing them all together through education campaigns? And then finally, creating a partnership where we can actually get something amazing and delicious to the table to start moving everything. Um, so I started doing that with my ingredients, finding different ingredients. This one is using tiger nut, um, plantain, and groundnuts. Um, this one is using um, sorghum, avocado, um, and other grains. Uh, this one is using amaranth, cashew, and um, 
tomatoes, and a local uh, basil. Um, and these are some of the spices that I came upon. And most of these spices um, you've probably never seen. Uh, one of them is um, Grain of Paradise. That's at about 1 o'clock. At about 4 o'clock is Saline Pepper. Uh, underneath is uh, about 6, 7 o'clock is Kubeb. The next one is an African nutmeg. And then the pod is called Prekase. Prekase is actually one of my favorite spices. And it doesn't have an English name. Um, and it's actually on a list of endangered ingredients. So how can I help to move this product into the mainstream? I started making them in chocolate. <laughs> so with the chocolates, um, the idea was, one, let's not only extract cocoa from Africa, let's actually make the chocolate in Africa, but let's give the chocolate a sense of place. So in all the different truffles that I make, I try to bring in different spices and flavors to get people to try them. So I'm really excited to know that, for example, in the United States, many people, for the first time that they're trying Prekase, is actually in my, tr my chocolates. Um, the idea is that the more we consume Prekase, the more likely um, we are to be excited to want to buy it, and then the, uh, we create a demand, and that people will be less likely to want to cut those trees down. So we need to kind of create and move that around. So the idea really is not just to have the solution of what is at my table, but how do we move it out and get the demand so that smallholder farmers can be growing ingredients that people are excited to eat. So um, just kind of going back, there are lots of us in this room. There are lots of ingredients that we can think about. But really, how can we all together come up with solutions that allow us to invest in creating those value chains that are needed and the demand and the education around a lot of the diverse crops that exist and create space for deliciousness. And I think the risk of us not succeeding is huge. We've talked about malnutrition, food insecurity, but there's a lot of other aspects that come in when we talk about the cultural aspect. Um, we've got, you know, loss of cultural diversity. We've got um, indigenous populations not having access to space, land, and also their food. Um, having culturally inappropriate food. Having a monotonous food system. Um, loss of livelihoods for a lot of these farmers that are smallholder communities. Urbanization, um, social injustice. So there's a lot that is at risk. So all together, um, I think that we need to come together, find solutions, but remember the past. So this is a, a symbol. It's one of the Adinkra symbols that comes from uh, the Ashanti kingdom. And most of these symbols represent larger um, concepts in life. And so this one is called Sankofa. And it's chicken facing forward, but with its neck turned back. Um, what it's holding is the golden egg. The golden egg is the knowledge of what we have. And so really, we need to it, it literally means go back and get it. How do we take that knowledge that we have and move it into the future? So if you can close your eyes with me again. Now, <clears throat> let's imagine ourselves at a beautiful long table, all of us sitting down, having a meal. On the table, we will have rice. We're going to have wheat. We're also going to have boma. We're also going to have African star fruit, and we're also going to have um, prekase at the table, and all of us sharing this wonderful, beautiful meal together. And I believe that these delicious partnerships that create value along the entire value chain is what we're looking for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking us through the beauty of food, through the beauty of diversity.